For today's lecture, we have Professor B. A. George in the chair. Professor George is professor of Japanese language and literature and the current chairperson of the Center for Japanese Studies, School of Language, Literature and Culture Studies at Jawaharlal Nehru University, New Delhi. He has done extensive research in modern Japanese literature, especially on uh, Shimazaki Tosong, Miyazawa Kenji, and Ishikawa Takuboku. Professor George has published several books, articles, and translations throughout his academic career, for which he was uh, bestowed with the Japanese Foreign Minister's commendation in 2016. He is also a recipient of the coveted Miyazawa Kenji Shore Sword Award by Hanamaki City Government in 2002 for his scholarly achievements and extensive research on Miyazawa Kenji. Uh, now I will hand over the virtual mic to Professor uh, George to conduct the rest of the proceedings. Professor George, please. Uh, you are muted. Uh, first of all, let me uh, thank Tariq for introducing me. And then uh, from my side, uh, good evening, very good, good evening to, uh, good evening and also good morning to all of you, because I think our uh, uh, main honor uh, speaker and then our discussion both of them are from USA and it is morning there so good morning a very good morning to uh, Dr. Kyungi and Dr. Urmula and uh, I am you know first of all uh, I would like to congratulate Professor Driss Tanga uh, retired professor of Delhi University and uh, Mr. Koji Sato Director General Japan Foundation and uh, Ms. Hayakawa, Director of Japan Foundation, and Dr. Tariq Sheikh, uh, as Assistant Browser in IFLU, for, you know, taking this initiative and, uh, you know, for conducting such uh, lecture series, which in India nobody has thought of so far. So I, from my heart, I would like to congratulate the uh, Japan Foundation officials for starting this uh, initiative. Uh, I would also like to thank uh, the organizers for uh, asking me to be the chair of today's uh, talk. Uh, as uh, Tariq has already uh, mentioned, we have the uh, second lecture in the series of uh, MS Visheshraya and Okafura Attention lecture series. And today our main speaker uh, is uh, Dr. Kyungi Pyun. Uh, he, she is an associate professor of art history uh, at, the, at the Fashion Institute of Technology, State University of New York. Her scholarship focuses on history of collecting reception of Asian art, a diaspora of Asian artists and Asian American visual culture. She wrote uh, fashion Identity Power in Modern Asia, and this was published in 2018, and which is uh, considered to be the major work she has done. And personally, she is uh, uh, at another uh, book project, uh, which is actually a, uh, her, uh, Invisible Nomads, Invisible Nomads and Weavers, the Uruks and Baker Walls and uh, Chunk Pass is a part of visual ethnographic research on the impact of migration and globalization on nomadic communities of weavers and farmers of Pashmina gods in Central Asia. And she has been teaching uh, the art of the Silk Road for more than uh, 10 years. Uh, now, she would be today, I think, talking especially on uh, uh, about the scholarship of textiles and introducing uh, various uh, exhibitions held in Europe and North America uh, since 1997 on the Central, Central Asian textiles. And we'll be discussing uh, the difficulties of terminology used in this field of uh, specialization. And also, uh, I think she would be giving insight to young scholars for joining research uh, on 
uh, Silk Road Textiles to stimulate more interdisciplinary research projects. Now let me also dis uh, introduce uh, today's discussant, Dr. Urmila Mohan. Uh, she is an anthropologist of material culture with a focus on clothing and bodily practices in and, and she is an adjunct faculty department of anthropology, New York University. Uh, Mohan is also the founder of editor of Open Access Digital Journal, the Jugad Project. And she has several uh, publications in uh, uh, journals, uh, which uh, I think uh, some of them are like uh, uh, <clears throat> clothing, uh, sorry. Uh, the material subject, rethinking bodies and objects in motion. Uh, and then uh, several other uh, uh, publications. Now, and also, uh, she is actually uh, uh, and uh, you know she is actually uh, in the uh, field of uh, curating an uh, exhibition of uh, made Watson textile collection at the American Museum of Natural History, New York. Now, actually, uh, before starting the talk today, I would like to uh, just mention a few points about the timings. As uh, you know, all of us know, total time meant for this uh, lecture is uh, 90 minutes. Uh, and um, out of that, about 50 minutes will be uh, can be used by Dr. Kyungi Pyun for her talk. And uh, suppose if she needs five or 10 minutes more, I think uh, Professor Tanga will also agree, we would uh, extend the time uh, at least maybe for five or 10 minutes more. After that, uh, Dr. Urmila Mohan will be given around 15 to 20 minutes uh, for uh, making comments on the Speak, uh, speech and then, of course, uh, comments and her opinion and her contribution to the topic for that 15 to 20 minutes. Thereafter, I think we will have another 15 minutes or 20 minutes for question and answer session. And this is the, I think, uh, time schedule which we kept today for the uh, program. Now, may I request uh, Dr. Kyungi Pyun to uh, deliver her talk. Uh, I think we are starting at 41, 4.41 Indian time. So that means uh, uh, you can have uh, uh, 50 minutes. That means uh, five, five uh, around 5.30. But another 10 more minutes we can extend if you need. So, thank you. Um, may I request, I, may yes. I request Dr. Kungi Boon to start her lecture now? Thank you so much, Professor George. It's a great honor to be invited to this wonderful talk series. And first of all, I'd like to um, thank Professor Bridget Tanka. Um, I worked with him uh, on my book, Fashion Identity and Power in Modern Asia around 2016, I think that was the beginning of it. And then the book was published in 2017. And since then, we remained as online friends, right, Professor Tanka? <laughs> we never met in person. Uh, I only see him today. This is the first time ever I see him. I saw his face on the internet, but <laughs> this is seeing live person, Professor Bridge Tanka. And he said he's as old as the Republic, but I don't think so. <laughs> <laughs> you can still teach, I think. Um, anyhow, um, and also I'd like to extend my thanks to uh, Japan Foundation. I worked closely with the Japan Foundation here in New York City as well. They funded several projects of mine by inviting Japanese artisans to my college, Fashion Institute of Technology, and it is a very well-organized uh, foundation. And thank you, uh, Mr. Sato, 
Um, and then uh, Yuka Sang and I were also exchanging emails. Um, so thank you so much. And Tariq uh, spent many hours to prepare for this lecture. And it's a great honor that I am the second speaker. So because I don't know what your disciplinary backgrounds are, so I just assume that you are or were conversant with Japanese studies. Um, and uh, I am not the expert of circular textiles. The reason I chose this topic is um, I have been teaching the art of the Silk Road for more than a decade. Um, and usually in art and design uh, settings. And I also teach Japanese art and civilization. Um, that is a standard art history class. And then as a scholar, I do research on um, history of collecting or reception of Asian art in general. So that's the intersectionality of why I am speaking in this honorable talk series. So you may be a little bit disappointed because I'm not a textile expert, uh, but I presented uh, at um, uh, textile or fashion conferences in the context of a pedagogy and exhibition. So that's what um, I am going to focus on today. So before I start my PowerPoint presentation, I want you to watch these three minute videos because it shows um, the image that you saw on the poster. Um, that is a Fushi uh, Yuwa uh, image, like um, the uh, what is the mythological ancestors of Chinese history. Um, so I am going to share my screen um, and then hold on. It's this one. So it's three minutes. <laughs> Harry, can you hear me? Can you hear the sound? <laughs> If you are joining by phone, you cannot understand the Korean at all, but we have English subtitles on the, on the screen. So he's showing the map, and then there is the view of Trufan, Astana tombs in Central Asia. So this is the painting of Fushi and Yuwa. But I want you to pay attention to the fabric conditions. Do you see all the stitches? So it's recently restored. So it's recently restored. So this is the painting so this shows men and women combined together, so uh, the mythological origin of the world, and it has a lot of celestial signs. So artistic techniques are related to mural painting techniques of the Silk Road. It tried to give like a three-dimensionality, but if you go back, it's actually coming from the Gupta period of India. And I want you to pay attention to, to this round motif, like a large circle uh, surrounded by smaller circles. This is very uh, idiosyncratic pattern of a Central Asian textile. See, you see the uh, same pattern on the pottery? You are going to see this a lot on textiles. 원래 어디에서 어떻게 사용되었던 그림이었을까요? 화면 가장자리 곳곳에 뚫려 있는 구멍들에서 그 단서를 찾을 수 있어요. So there are numerous small holes around the banner. 천장에 붙이기 위해 So originally it was pasted on the ceiling of the tomb. So you're going to look at it while lying down. 복귀화가 창조한 하늘이 되는 것입니다. 즉이 그림은 무덤 내부를 죽은 사람이 맞이하는 영적 공간으로 만들어주는 중요한 장치인 것입니다. 
결과적으로 두 창조신이 서로 몸을 꼬고 있는 모습을 통해 우주와 만물이 생겨남을 상징하는 이 그림은 죽은 자의 재생과 죽음을 기원하는 당시 투르파한 사람들의 염원이 담긴 그림이라고 할수 있습니다. So it was made by the National Museum of Korea. So now we are back here, and I am going back to. Uh, let me turn this off, and then I'm going back to my PowerPoint presentation. Ah, uh, sorry, this is not. This is not it. This is my flyer. Okay, so hold on. Let me have to uh, stop presenting. And then I have to share, share my PowerPoint. It takes a few seconds because we are so far away. Um, so please be patient when I forward my images. I also see a little bit of delay. Uh, so now I think you are looking at my PowerPoint and I'm going into my presentation mode. Hold on, I want to make it a little bit smaller. Okay, I cannot make it smaller. So once I am in the presentation mode, I cannot really see you. So somebody should speak up if something doesn't go well. Like, you know, if I, my slide doesn't move forward, you have to let me know, okay? Um, so now I'm, yeah, I'm going into the presentation. So this is my uh, talk uh, and um, Silk Road Textiles in Korea and Japan, a history of collecting. Um, so moving on. So this is a typical map of the Silk Road that you uh, you see uh, in various internet sources. Uh, but um, as you can see, it combines, I mean, it, it encompasses many different countries. Um, and then the eastern end of the Silk Road is Korean Peninsula and go all the way to Japan, especially Kyoto, the imperial capital uh, of uh, ancient Japan, um, all the way until Heian period. But in many cases, uh, this is a, a map in my textbook. I use this textbook called Richard Ford's Religions, Religions Along the Silk Road. Um, this book is very convenient uh, with less than 200 pages and explaining um, various origins of religions along the Silk Road. Um, students read, uh, I think it's uh, seven chapters uh, in the beginning of the semester. But here, um, this map somehow shows that Silk Road ends with Xi'an in China, right? Or Luoyang, if you go a little bit to the north, I mean, to the, to the east, but then it does not even show Japan. <laughs> Somebody should complain to this author, right? Uh, well, you know, Buddhism spread along the Silk Road to Korean Peninsula and all the way to Japan. And that's why um, we are studying the Silk Road um, in, in a very large uh, Eurasian uh, phenomenon. And um, the, the name Silk Road, as you know, it came from a German scholar in the 19th century. Um, and since then, it was used, but uh, maybe focus on silk itself uh, could be somewhat problematic. And I'm going to talk about it a little bit later. Um, and uh, we should not forget that Silk Road is not the only route. Uh, we also had a uh, trade route um, in the in uh, inner Asia. Um, and then we also had a maritime trade route. So it's more like a global trade route rather than focusing so much on silk. Um, so uh, today's talk a little bit is, is, a, is a continuation of my um, own uh, paper called A Journey Through the Silk Road in a Cosmopolitan Classroom. Uh, this was a chapter in Teaching Medieval and Early Modern Cross-Cultural Encounters Across Disciplines and Eras. So Silk Road became very important um, subject matter when cross-cultural encounters became quite popular in academia uh, from mid-1990s. Um, so in that particular essay, I actually talk about my own personal experience of learning about the Silk Road. And that was more than 30 years ago in South Korea. Uh, there is a geopolitical context to it. 
And then um, I started teaching about Silk Road uh, from early 2000s. Um, so that is my syllabus on the development of the Silk Road. And then um, I talk a lot about the problems of teaching Silk Road as a current project. Um, so discussing quality in material culture. And this I will talk a little bit about um, uh, about it in today's class. And then uh, when I just wrote uh, this chapter, uh, it was after September 11, and uh, it was also after the Taliban exploded the Bamiyan Colossal Buddha. You know, so I'm talking about those geopolitical context, but I am also writing a new chapter for a book called Teaching South and Southeast Asian Art. And in it, I'm going to talk about the war in Afghanistan, it's another dimension to it. And I talk about how to be a cosmopolitan citizen. So today's class, you will also hear about what kind of students I've taught in the Silk Road class. So most of you are coming from the Japanese studies background. How do you know about the Silk Road? Usually through this context of Shoso in treasury in Todaiji temple, Nara was the um, very uh, exuberant and outgoing period. So a lot of Chinese artifacts arrived in Japan and many of them are um, stored in Shoso in treasury. Um, and um, the date was around 754. So we know that things that are, you know, things that are deposited in Shoso in is dated by that middle of the eighth century. And for many historians and art historians, uh, artworks or you know the, the gifts uh, stored in Shoso in treasury became chronological standards. Uh, before Shoso in treasury uh, was open to the public in the early 20th century. We knew about these artworks, right, through excavations or through other collections, um, and then just assumed the Tang Dynasty, but we could not really date whether it's a pre-750 or post-750. But after Shoso in Treasury uh, opened um, to the academic community, we can now firmly date, right, like, uh, you know, the 750 before or post. Um, so this is another map that you usually see in relation to Shoso in treasury um, in popular art history books. So um, there is a map of the Silk Road um, and then it shows various artifacts that uh, came from the country of origin. So these musical instruments um, in Shoso in treasury, they are coming from Sasanian Persia and along with other metal works. Uh, and then if you go a little bit um, to, um, to the east, some of the uh, masks may come from the northern India or, um, or some of the, these type of metal works or lacquered mirror coming from uh, Central Asia. And a lot of artifacts are coming from China along the Silk Road and eventually going to uh, Shoso in treasury in Kyoto. So this is one of those examples of the uh, Go, like a Japanese, um, you know, board game Go, uh, right? On um, And it is a beautiful inlaid lacquered wood basket. And you have little uh, drawers where you can uh, take out the, um, uh, you know, the stone pieces. Um, and then you have a bronze mirror with amber and mother of pearl decorations of the really uh, luxurious objects. And the luxury, the focus on luxury, um, is also related to Shoso in treasury. I mean, why do we call it treasury? <laughs> because these are precious diplomatic gifts. So in the scholarship of the Silk Road, uh, when you uh, talk about these diplomatic gifts, um, then uh, it, also, it, it, re it naturally refers to uh, luxurious objects. Um, so the Shoso in treasury have some, uh, had some fragmentary silk textiles. Um, but uh, the, because of the condition of the textiles, they are not often exhibited well. You have to look at the um, uh, catalog of the Shoso in treasury and to see what's inside there. Uh, but usually um, it's not readily available or exhibited. The Shoso in treasury itself uh, has very limited access um, so that uh, a lot of scholars are waiting for annual or um, you know, sometimes like uh, every other year, like uh, exhibitions uh, from the Shoso in treasury. Um, so 
the most representative type of silk textile from Shoso in Treasury or those era is this uh, pattern uh, of medallions of hunting scenes in the middle. Uh, and this is, uh, says, brocaded silk. And this one, particular one, is in Horyuji Temple uh, in Nara. It's kept in Horyuji Temple, uh, not so sure, in Treasury. Uh, and this is uh, probably used as a um, precious uh, fabric to cover reliquaries or other um, treasure objects. Um, in uh, in European context, some of those uh, luxury textiles are used as a liner for reliquaries. So the wooden caskets they have a lining with a silk. Um, so um, in a lot of silk road textiles, focus on this pattern of medallions. Um, so large medallions in the middle, you have a symmetrical. Uh, graphic images usually repeated um, with a, a vertical axis, as you can see, it's uh, repeated. Uh, and then in between, you have a palmet. Um, this is a plant motif that are popular in uh, West Asian art, like Persia, uh, those places. Um, so palmet is represented um, throughout. So it's a juxtaposition between palmet and um, hunting scenes or sometimes animal processions, you know, those scenes together. Um, and then uh, if you look at uh, an example uh, of a contemporary period, um, people usually say it's related to Sasanian Persian Empire, the silk, uh, where you, you also see the medallions frame uh, with the hunting scenes in the middle. And hunting uh, is a very important symbolic action, I mean, symbolic ritual uh, from West Asia. Um, and then uh, in Chinese context, uh, hunting scenes are sometimes um, uh, replaced with animals. In this case, it's duck uh, facing each other. But you can still see the, the uh, basic components of medallions around it. And what is amazing about this uh, type of silk road textile called brocaded silk is that they are in multicolors uh, and they are carefully woven, um, not not embroidered. Um, so you can imagine an intricate process of colored um, threads going through uh, you know, different parts of the textiles in order to create that particular uh, patterns in colors. Um, so this one uh, that you see on the bottom uh, is Sogudian silk. Um, so uh, the idea is this particular fabric was woven in Sogudiana, uh, which is the current Samarkand in West Asia. And um, Sogudian merchants probably worked as a middleman to trade between China and West Asia. But throughout those experiences, they also learned, uh, acquired the techniques to weave their own silk. Um, so this is a Sogudian silk. Um, so um, this is a excavated uh, jacket for a Tibetan prince. This is a children's clothes uh, from Tibet, uh, small in size. Uh, and uh, it is rare to see uh, this much vivid colors remaining. Uh, but you can see the red, green, blue, and yellow, and then the white, uh, five major colors are used. Uh, and then the, the variations of a palmet patterns are inserted in between. Um, and uh, quite lavish uh, design. And if you see my book, uh, Journey Through a Cosmopolitan Classroom, um, I also included, did I have it? Oh, no, I didn't bring it. But uh, this jacket is outer garment. And then this little prince had a uh, white or ivory color Chinese silk ensemble of a pencil jacket. And then on top of it, uh, he had uh, this colorful Sogdian silk jacket on the top. So it was uh, a rarity. It, again, it was probably traded as a uh, ultra luxury uh, item. Um, and um, you know, because it was a prince, they you they made you know made a small um, jacket out of that uh, medallion uh, patterns. Uh, it's currently kept at the Cleveland Museum of Art. Uh, but uh, the other way of Sogudian silk uh, or even Chinese silk is found in 
the um, Byzantine Empire, as you all know. Um, and this is in Italy, a harbor city called Ravenna um, in the uh, northwest corner of uh, um, Italy, like above Venice. Um, so here, um, Ravenna is actually slightly south of Venice. Um, so you see in the church of San Vitale, um, Emperor Justinian and Empress Theodora uh, are depicted as a procession, like uh, giving offerings to the church. And here, if you see the Empress Theodora and her attendants, you can see a very lavish uh, animal patterned brocaded silk. Um, and especially the woman right next to uh, Theodora, Empress Theodora, you can see her like a medallion patterned uh, clothes. I mean, it, you know, in the middle, there is no hunting scenes or animal motifs, but you can see um, the basic patterns are carried on. And then the woman next to her, um, she has, uh, looks like a crane or like a duck style animals lining up. So um, it was a very popular pattern, again, luxurious pattern around the world, 7th and 8th century. So um, from the Byzantine context, um, you still see the medallion patterns. And in the middle, you have a winged horse with a peacock tail. So different communities had a, uh, had a different preference for animals or symbols that will go into the medallions. Um, and uh, the really, really lavish example um, in the western part of the Silk Road is um, this little fragment found in Emperor Charmani's tomb uh, from Aachen. Uh, and here uh, they translate this as a silk surge, silk surge textile showing uh, the triumph of Alexander or charioteer in the hippo from uh, in Constantinople. So definitely Byzantine uh, fabric. And unlike the Sogodian silk that we've seen earlier, uh, that comes in multiple colors and very complicated weaving techniques, this one is rather simpler, right? The pattern is difficult, but you can see that uh, it is just a combination of blue and uh, gold or blue and yellow, right? Um, so um, this is the impact of the international trade along the Silk Road. Uh, and one more example uh, was uh, this. Um, this one is a large medallion uh, as a part of the imperial costume. Um, and um, you can see that um, uh, the, the riders or the knights um, in that full a uh, ceremonial uh, garment are riding the horse and then um, they are conquering lions underneath. Uh, and instead of uh, pearl strings, uh, here you are going to you see the um, uh, plant motifs around it. Um, so this is 8th century Byzantine silk. Um, so uh, with the rise of the, um, uh, the medallion silk pattern, which is originally coming from West Asia, uh, each community uh, or each, uh, each culture entities came up with their own uh, variations, uh, but it was international uh, trend uh, in the 8th century. And you see the eastern end of it in Japan, like the Shoso in Treasury or Horyuji Temple. And then you see the west end in um, as far as in Germany, like the Charmani tomb here. Um, so, uh, you know, now I am going into uh, why I brought up uh, history of a collection in Japan and Korea, especially for experts of Japanese studies like you. Um, so um, the video that you saw earlier, um, it is made by the National Museum of Korea. So Korea is a part of the Silk Road and we have artifacts from the Three Kingdoms period, Three Kingdoms period, which is uh, seventh century um, CE after Common Era. Uh, so we have uh, funerary objects that traveled along the Silk Road. Um, so uh, Silk Road was always a part of the national history uh, because in ancient times, um, you know, we we were taught when I was, uh, you know. Uh, student uh, in South Korea, uh, that we are part of that international trade route. Uh, and then in tombs in Gyeongju, uh, southern uh, east, you know, like, a, what is it, uh, 
east, uh, no, uh, southeast corner of Korean Peninsula, um, there are a lot of tombs with uh, uh, ornaments or glasswares that were definitely made in uh, West Asia and traveled through, and then somehow given to people in, I mean, uh, rulers of the three kingdoms from uh, from China as diplomatic gifts. Um, so we were aware of this, uh, but recently when the National Museum of Korea relocated to Yongsan, it's a big um, national park area in the middle of Seoul, uh, they decided to show uh, works, uh, Silk Road uh, artifacts uh, from Otani collection. Many of you are familiar with Otani collection, but uh, when I was in, even in high school, uh, we heard about the Silk Road, mostly in the context of ancient trade route, not through the Otani collection, <laughs> but these days, um, students uh, in, in, you know, like students uh, in Millennium, um, they are learning about it by visiting this Otani collection at the National Museum of Korea on the third floor um, of the building. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, this. So we have, we can think about the Silk Road as a national history. It's the same context as Shoso in Treasury is taught, right? It's a part of the national history of Japan. Then uh, this is a dimension of a global history, right? So it grows from West Asia to East Asia, you know, along with the spread of Buddhism, uh, Buddhism, which originated from uh, India and, you know, the Nepal area. I mean, it is very important. So we are in a way connected um, as a globe. So usually the first two was the dimensions that we were learning about Silk Road. Um, I don't know how the Silk Road is taught in India. I, I want to know more about it. Uh, and, but then um, in the, in the millennials, uh, we are now talking about uh, the uh, Silk Road as part of a colonial history. So somebody went to Central Asia in the early 20th century, and that was uh, Otani. Um, and then he left some of, it's not actually him who left it, but uh, his collection ended up uh, being stored at the National Museum of Korea. Um, and then, um, you know, if you search for Otani collection in Korean news media, there are a lot of talks about uh, decolonizing uh, process. Like, uh, do we have to return these uh, objects back to countries in Central Asia? Uh, or, you know, what kind of support can we give? Uh, how do we present these artworks as part of the National Museum of Korea? Um, is it part of National Museum of Korea? So this is the current structure of National Museum of Korea. There are a lot of books written on the structure and exhibition design of the National Museum of Korea uh, in the past 20 years. Uh, but anyhow, the result is on the third floor, there is a section called World Civilizations. And in it, we have these uh, galleries of in Egypt, Central Asia, India, Southeast Asia, China, Japan, world ceramics. So uh, Otani collection uh, is the majority of the gallery of Central Asia. Um, so here, this is the exterior of the National Museum. Um, and then the third floor, um, especially the west wing that you see over here, uh, there are small, so galleries are not so big. Um, and here you have a uh, Central Asian part as well. Uh, but Korean national history uh, is spread on two floors uh, here, first floor, uh, and then a little bit on the second floor, uh, and then even the third floor, sculpture and crafts. Um, so who was Otani uh, Kozui? Um, he was born in 1876, died in 1948, and he had three times uh, uh, in Central Asia, uh, 1902 to 4, 8 to 9, and 10 to 14, and I have a map for it. And um, major uh, artifacts came from Bezeklik, uh, which is near Tufan, and then Kijil, uh, Yarhoto, and uh, Kuntura, and Miran. Um, and then uh, why did he come to uh, Korea? I will show you the, the, the picture of his uh, summer house, I mean, he's a country state, <laughs> so that's because of uh, the reason that it's in the uh, National Museum, but um, 
1915 uh, here, as you can see, uh, his collection was organized into the book. So we have this, uh, uh, this is how you read uh, this Chinese characters in, to, in Korean, uh, archaeological research in uh, Chinese uh, Turkistan album of the excavated objects. And then much later in 1937, um, he wrote a new uh, record of the Western regions. And um, uh, so uh, some of the works were given to the Japanese government general uh, in, in Korea. Um, and most important uh, artifacts are 60 murals. Um, so this is uh, Otani Kozui. Uh, and this is the image of his expedition, uh, people on the uh, camels, right? Like uh, carrying a lot of boxes together. Um, and then so, uh, but his collections are spread uh, among China, Japan, and Korea. And then uh, the number of uh, items are about 1,500 in Korea, 60 pieces, not, not, not 50. Uh, about of them are mural uh, paintings. So about the motivation of Otani going to Central Asia, um, it's usually driven by this idea of one Asia. I think many of you are familiar with it, like uh, influenced by the Tagore, the, uh, Indian poet, uh, people like Okakura Kakuzo and others, uh, Okakura Tenshin, uh, um, others uh, were writing books like this, uh, The Ideas of the East, The Awakening of Japan. So uh, Japanese civilization is a part of a larger or uh, one Asian culture or, or one Asian civilization. And then uh, people like Okakura emphasized that centrality of Japanese culture. Right? If you remember the map of you know, Silk Road, it's all the way to the east, right? It's the extreme end of it. But um, in the authors from the early 20th century, um, they uh, create a narrative that actually it's, uh, you know, Japan is the uh, quite essential and central uh, position in that narrative of one Asia. And, you know, simply what we are doing now is to regain that position, right? Um, so, uh, Okakura Kakuzo was a curator at the Museum uh, of Fine Arts in Boston uh, from 1905 all the way until he he died, um, and uh, he himself, as you can see in his fashionable dress, he himself embodied the idea, the idea of one Asia, uh, or I myself call it hybrid fashion, hybridity. So he combined um, Chinese uh, long uh, outer garment <laughs> along with a little bit of uh, design that he created. But do you know where he had these uh, clothes made? If you read Christine Guth's essay, um, you can see that he went to uh, Calcutta, like a Kolkata, uh, to have a tailor made his Chinese robes. It's a very interesting combination of hybrid, isn't it? Um, anyhow, uh, but I always emphasize that when he was living in Japan, um, 1880s, he really showed um, himself as a very stylish, um, modernized the gentleman along with his American colleagues. So uh, if you want to know more about uh, this uh, type of dress, like, you know, identity expressed through the modern dress, I want you to read uh, Professor Buruji Tanka's essay, Monks in Modern Dress, The Dilemma of Being Japanese and Asia. So here, uh, Professor Tanka also emphasized, uh, you know, like uh, dressing as an Asian uh, instead of just being Japanese, uh, and uh, in you know he also used this particular picture of Ishimura Isaku uh, when he visited Singapore. He dressed himself in Singapore like indigenous. School. There was no country like in Singapore at the time, so we have to say something like um, uh, uh, you know Southern Asian uh, clothes um, and and you know have a picture taken um, and. Um, the essay by Professor Tanka also had a section of Otani Kozui as well. Um, so there are many uh, essays on uh, career of Otani, uh, but uh, overall, uh, he came from a very, very important family. Um, and his family uh, became advocates for Western education. So uh, the Nishi Honganji um, like a Temple Foundation uh, established the Liu Koku University. 
Um, and uh, I read uh, this Professor Kyung Mi Ju's essay. Um, uh, you know, she wrote a column uh, for New Silk Road. So in it, she actually uh, followed all the major uh, areas uh, of uh, estate um, owned by um, uh, the uh, Otani and his family. But why was he so powerful and able to go to expedition to Silk Road? Um, he got married to um, the Kujo family's daughter. And then uh, the Kujo family uh, is really established aristocrats um, so that um, Otani's wife's sister became empress. Um, so during the Taisho period, uh, he was at the pinnacle of power and authority and also wealthy from the, the long uh, the legacy of Nishi Honganji Temple. Um, and uh, he, so 1899, he went to China and then 1902, he studied in England. Um, and, uh, you know, going back to the, his eclectic taste, this is the point of uh, eclecticism. Um, so this mansion, Nira Kuzo, doesn't exist anymore because it was burnt uh, in the fire. Uh, but this is known as Indian style architecture, right? <laughs> you can recognize Indian style arches and you know imitation of the wooden structures here. Um, and um, so in 1914, after he came back from the expedition, um, he was in a uh, scandal. Um, five of his monks uh, embezzled the fund from the foundation. Um, so that uh, he was under investigation uh, and um, he decided to go to um, China. Like uh, here, I'm sorry about the typo, it's not 1714, 1914. Um, he was a sort of a force to leave. He uh, stepped down from the uh, Nishi Honganji Foundation and uh, he decided to spend the time in Manchu. And you have to remember, you know, a lot of intellectuals or uh, politicians, they went to Manchu as a new land of opportunities, right? Like Manchu is, is not really uh, part of um, the tight uh, national uh, control of mainland China. It was sort of, a, you know, on the, in the north uh, after Xinhai Revolution, um, 1910, um, so that um, Japan, Japanese empire is going to uh, established their own authority in there and eventually that led to the second Sino-Manchurian War. Um, anyhow, so uh, he had to sell this uh, estate uh, in Hyogo Prefecture. Um, so the new owner, his name is Kuhara Fusanosuke, um, he was a good friend. He was a minister of commerce uh, and he was also a, a business person of railroad and steel and um, he was a good friend with um the governor uh, of you know japanese governor in korea takeuchi so he decided to donate uh, you know, uh items that were in the basement of this building basement of this estate to uh takeuchi um, so that's how the silk road objects uh, became part of the National Museum of Korea. So these are the map of uh, our expedition and you don't really have to pay attention, but what I want to tell you is they were very systematic. So they went to the Pamir uh, Plateau in the beginning, right? And then another team at the same time went uh, through the Northern route. And then um, they realized that, well, we didn't visit, visit so many. So uh, next time um, they went through all the way through the northern route and then another team went all the way through the southern route and then the final um they went through uh some more cities that they didn't go so all the way into the northern part or you know other areas spent more time so in a way they are combing the area in three different parts but as most of you understand uh, this is after Orel Stein visited after Sven had him visited. So, um, uh, you know, Otani felt a little restless and anxious that not much left <laughs> behind, uh, but, but still he was able to, uh, you know, grab a lot of things. Um, so uh, when the uh, collection was donated to um, 
Japanese government general um, in 1915, um, there was an exhibition here uh, in the palace. Uh, this is an old palace of the past the Joseon dynasty, but it became museums in the, in the early 20th century. So here you can see the uh, mural painting from Bezeklik exhibited. Um, and there are other objects too. So it's 1916. So people like me who grew up in the 1980s and 90s, we didn't see much of the Otani collection in person. Uh, it was briefly shown in the early 20th century, but after that, um, it was just kept in the storage. There, it was never visibly exhibited, uh, but uh, after the National Museum moved to the new location, they have a more space. Um, and also um, culturally, uh, South Korea as a, as a cultural entity became more confident. So they now have uh, means and context to interpret their colonial history um, in, a, in a more positive way, right? Um, so that um, in 2000s and so forth, uh, there are a lot of uh, publications and special exhibitions using uh, Otani collection. Um, so this is a catalog, Central Asian Religious Paintings in the National Museum of Korea. A very important book. If you are curious of iconography or origins of each painting, then you should go uh, to read this book. Uh, Kim Hae-won is, is, by the way, a good friend of mine. <laughs> Anyhow, um, so recently in 2021, um, they also uh, exhibited um, the documents. Uh, so lingua franca right, like a common language along the Silk Road was a Chinese character. Uh, even though there are a number of spoken languages and other types of written languages were available, um, uh, this is, uh, you know, one exhibition on Chinese characters. Um, so um, the object that you are seeing here um, is uh, um, sort of a coffin. I mean, you only see a fragment of it, it's a cut out fragment, but you have to imagine it uh, sort of a woven mat, like sort of a Latin style woven mat extended, and then the dead body is going to be placed on the top. Um, but uh, it, uh, you know, that Latin mat uh, is covered with uh, scriptures, uh, like an official document. Um, so that uh, here it's exhibited as a part of uh, written documents, but in my context, this is part of material culture or even clothing materials uh, showing that the straws are, are woven tightly in order to make a uh, mat or um, this could be you know, made as a functional robe, uh, like a snow gear and other things. Um, and um, the, what is interesting about Otani collection is a lot of people just focus on uh, mural paintings uh, from Buddhist cave temples. Uh, that is major, but there are also many other um, uh, daily life objects or funerary objects, such as funerary doors and shoes. Um, so here, these doors are made of leftover used papers or other discarded documents. It's not made of ceramics. If you remember Tang Dynasty funerary doors, uh, most of them were glazed ceramics. But in Central Asia, they used, uh, more, you know, how can I say, mixed media in a way, right? <laughs> like a contemporary art, they used mixed media and discarded documents. Um, and then um, they also created the shoes. These are all in funerary context. Uh, and some of them are pretty well made. Um, combination of clay and other materials. A woman riding horse showing fashionable Tang Dynasty woman's fashion at the time. Um, but why am I talking about the textiles? So here, um, a lot of examples are painted on fabrics. So uh, some are painted on paper. Uh, and then the number two is the mural painting, uh, but you can also see um, the Buddhist iconography painted on paper. So here, number three, four, five, these are on paper. Uh, but when you see the descriptions of these um, cloth, uh, it's rather ambiguous. And I think the museum is um, trying to run more uh, scientific analysis, uh, but uh, it simply says textiles. Uh, obviously, it's not silk. If uh, it's known as a silk, they will put silk. Uh, but um, it's some sort of like a plant-based uh, hemp or linen style fabric. 
Um, so we are waiting for scientific analysis. Uh, but in Central Asia, what what are also found is these type of prehistoric objects. Uh, and this is also coming from the Otani collection. In the past, um, there was not many experts you know, devoted to Otani collection. So they simply thought it's also from the same time with um, same time with the Buddhist mural paintings. Uh, and also the catalog that I showed to you, like uh, for the Otani collection written in the early 20th century, they were wrong. Um, so now what they ex, you know, discovered is these are actually part of uh, uh, the Chinese Bronze Age called the Xiaohe Xiao Ho civilization. Where is the Xiaohe? Oh, Xiaohe, sorry, it's XIO, Xiaohe funerary district in Xinjiang Uyghur area here. Um, and uh, it's a Bronze Age culture, and I shouldn't say it's a Chinese because it's uh, located in Central Asia, and we don't know much about the residents uh, of this uh, Bronze Age uh, Xiaohe, you know, here Xiaohe civilization site. Um, uh, do I have the pen? Where? Ah, uh, it's an arrow. Okay, sorry, I wanted to get the pen. Uh, so here, uh, if you go here, uh, the Xiaohe, this is what Chinese people are calling it, but uh, it may ma not be ethnically Chinese people. Uh, anyhow, um, so these are made of rope and felt and other diverse materials. Uh, so going back to this restored banner of Fuxi and Yuwa, uh, originally it was fragmentary. How fragmentary was it? Um, this is a different banner, but it's almost like this. Uh, and the, the, the conservator at the National Museum, they carefully stitched it together and restored and matched. So colors are even a little bit different, right? And then um, they made a large banner like this. Um, so there was also an exhibition after the restoration was over. Uh, but this is another, uh, uh, the Fushi and Yuwa iconography. And this is, uh, thin slab of a mural painting taken, so not on the textile. Um, so, you know, the reason I am bringing up this particular uh, example is when we say silk road artifacts, we sort of assume that we want to see a lot of silk fabrics or silk fragments. Uh, and there are definitely a lot of uh, painted um, paintings, like a Buddhist paintings um, on silk, uh, but we also have uh, uh, various other types of textiles. Um, so here um, they say uh, linen, but um, it's not really like a ramy linen. Um, it's more like a hemp style, like a rough plant plant based textiles. Um, so, uh, and also if you think about the origins of cotton, where did it start? Cotton plant originate from Central Asia. So in uh, Otani collection, we have another fragmentary uh, objects. Again, we don't know whether it's on silk or not. Um, and it is, um, uh, it's not restored yet, uh, but they can, you know, they can start it or create a, um, uh, what is it, the restoration painting, right? Like, a, um, uh, they can imagine what this could be based on the mural painting iconography. Um, and then we have these uh, drawings, uh, not the multicolor painting, but this kind of drawings. And the purpose of these banners are um, actually a long, very long uh, hanging uh, panel uh, that these are usually placed on both the sides of the altar inside the temple or inside the Buddhist cave. Um, and then um, you can have uh, many uh, Buddhists, I mean, Bodhisattvas or guardian figures in vertical lines, um, one after another. Um, so again, uh, when you see the museum description, it simply says cloth. Um, so you know, usually we assume that it's not on silk, uh, same as uh, linen, uh, hemp linen. This one uh, looks like um, 
drawing, uh, but this is actually on dark paper, like a dyed, indigo dyed dark paper. And then um, the painting is uh, usually should be in gold, but you know it could be a yellow pigment. Um, so we need more descriptions of it. So uh, the National Museum is spending more and more time in studying um, studying and restoring and exhibiting uh, Otani collection objects. So um, here, let's talk briefly about audiences of the Silk Road textiles. I know it's uh, you know one, it's uh, you know 50 minutes past. So I'm going to quickly talk five or more minutes, and then I'm going to finish it. So uh, so you know in Japan and in Korea, uh, maybe it's true for China, but I don't want to talk about the contemporary mainland China, uh, but. Uh, Korea and uh, Japan, uh, you know, which is known as ethno-national country, right? Like one ethnic group makes one country. Um, in those those uh, governments uh, or uh, na nations, um, Silk Road is taught as part of national history. Uh, but uh, for museum audiences in Europe and North America, uh, they don't have this homogeneous national history or the context. So on them, uh, museum usually focuses on silk as an exotic luxury. Um, and uh, because it's usually pre-modern, they also want to uh, bring more uh, context to contemporary museum viewers. And usually it's the traded exotic luxury items. Um, and um, you know, Central Asia is very difficult to um, uh, to characterize because there is no single famous nation states. Uh, I'm not saying the fame is important, but uh, you know, most of those independent countries in Central Asia used to be part of former Soviet Union, right? So uh, it, it's a little hard to make the case for them. Um, so in uh, the museum world, uh, one of the most famous exhibition about the Silk Road was this exhibition called when silk was gold, Central Asian and Chinese textiles. So uh, that was shown in 1997. Um, uh, and this is the exhibition views of 1999. So in my other um, presentations at the, um, at the textile associations or international silk road studies, you know, those conferences I talked uh, in depth uh, about the exhibition strategies of the when silk was gold. Uh, I'm going to skip a little bit. Um, so usually these are the specimen of uh, silk road textiles in museum collections. They are they are never large. <laughs> usually it's uh, it's uh, saved uh, from something, right? So usually it's very small fragments, and also. I sometimes suspect that um, textile dealers could have sold multiple pieces like this um, in a smaller scale. Uh, then they can maximize their benefits because we know this practice from uh, book sales, right? Like a Mughal miniatures, you know, those kind of, or you know, European miniatures. That's what dealers also do. They cut out uh, into smaller pieces and sell uh, more. Um, so the vocabulary is really hard. Um, so if you are, ex I mean, textile expert, you must see the Chinese translation of it. Um, then you can uh, have a little bit more understanding, like uh, it's a, a pattern, woven pattern, uh, woven pattern uh, with gold, uh, silk, uh, silk, golden thread, right? That's what the Chinese character says. Uh, but if you see the generic description in English, that, that's usually textile with a swan hunt, comma, silk, or textile with the floral patterns, comma, silk. And most people, uh, museum goers, uh, they don't really understand whether that these are embroidered or they are woven together or they are stamped. But in textile uh, you know, studies, these are huge differences, right? In, term, in terms of the, the difficulty or the level of uh, excellence, uh, weaving together is extremely difficult, right? Um, embroidery is rather easier. Um, and then when you make the golden thread, I mean, Indian traditional textiles have a lot of gold thread too, but what kind of gold thread they used, right? It's not pure gold gold. It's usually uh, coiled around thin paper thread. Um, then how thin they are, or you know what kind of coiling that is. Um, so all of these technicalities matter 
uh, but it's it's very difficult to present all of them uh, in the museum context. So when silk was gold was already already what well, like uh, we are now 2021. So about 20 let's say 25 years ago, right? So exhibition techniques changed since then, um, and there are daily objects like this uh, in from a funerary context, right? Usually excavated from the tomb. Uh, so you have a purses, boots like this. So anyhow, after that exhibition, um, that, uh, you know, the silk like uh, bearing titles became very popular. And I actually used this book called Life Along the Silk Road uh, by Susan Whitfield. I don't know whether you've read it. I highly recommend you, you know, uh, reading it as a whole. Um, it is well-written historical narrative. Uh, it's a history book, uh, but it, it has a story, like uh, there is a story to it. Um, so these are um, many exhibitions on the Silk Road since then for the past 20 years or so, and more will come. Um, so here is my critique uh, to it, uh, and that is we are going into this interwoven globe exhibition catalog, which is very important. Um, so moving on, uh, what I want to tell you is so uh, how do we exhibit the Silk Road textiles? Uh, now, uh, a lot of museums incorporate VR, virtual reality, or augmented reality. And a lot of uh, millennials want to experience it. Like uh, baby boomers, they just want to see it in person. That was a traditional museum experience. But, but these days, they want to touch things, right? They want to um, surrounded by it. They want more stories with it. I guess they are also an Netflix generation. So what are we going to do? So uh, I recently wrote an essay called Asian Physics of Mannequins in American Art Museums. Uh, and it's in this book. Uh, and here I talk about problems of using mannequins uh, in museum exhibitions. Um, in the early 20th century, in the context of world expositions, using human figures was very popular. But from uh, Cold War era and all the way to the you know, late 20th century, uh, museums just stopped using mannequins because it's uh, so outdated, uh, it is not well balanced. Uh, and with, with a lot of reasons, but uh, recently now, you know, in 2013 and 17, you somehow see the comeback of use of mannequins. And I don't know whether you are aware of the famous Kenji exhibition, um, Heian period exhibition at the Metropolitan Museum, but I was so amused to see uh, Kenji, Prince Kenji in a, in a tall mannequin. <laughs> He's just standing in a Japanese pal palatial room in, in one of those exhibitions. So, you know, but, but people want to see more and more of those, uh, um, the human representations. Um, so how are we going to address those? Um, so this was an important exhibition called Interwoven Globe at the Metropolitan Museum. And um, this one is not focusing on one single media or type of textiles or one single geographic location. This is actually worldwide textile trade. Um, so a lot of Indian textiles were part of it. Um, and then you can see the Chinese textiles were influenced by Indian or sometimes India was influenced by China. And then they were actively traded from you know, 1500 until 1800. And then some of the fabrics somehow moved all the way to Europe and it became they are clothes, like a fashion. So you also see the garment examples. Um, but then we also have a layer of VR these days. Um, and people want to imagine more things. Um, so this is the you know, problematic uh, intersection of how to represent textiles of the Silk Road. I mean, Buddhist paintings, it's already representational enough. You, you don't need more layers. But textiles, it's always more difficult to display. And how you are going to display um, tells us a lot about uh, interpretation of culture. Um, so this is what is left for us um, uh, at this time. So I'm going to stop sharing. And then I'm going to uh, turn the table to uh, Professor Armila Mohan. And thank you so much for listening uh, to my lengthy talk. Uh, so go ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hyungi. It was a very enlightening talk. 
wonderful talk i think that we have, many of us are amateurs so we could get a, a glimpse of how the ancient silk route you know carried various artifacts and uh, silk textiles uh, across the world here actually and about the byzantine silk and central asian silk uh, i think there was a large market in europe what about chinese uh, silk it was also i think uh, accepted and used in uh, european market from right from the ancient uh, period uh, and i would also later on if you have time during the question answer session would like to know what, how was the reverse flow to china whether silks from other countries or other textiles i mean textiles and other artifacts from other countries how they were received by the chinese china by the ancient chinese kingdom so that would also be very helpful for all the audience today means participants here so that especially young participants who could you know uh, and you you also i think uh, inquired about uh, research in uh, india on silk road i think uh, maybe there are you know in southern part silk road of the yeah, sorry the silk road of the sea i think some research is going on i don't know exactly what is happening about silk road of uh, land maybe professor uh, thanga will be would be the the person to enlighten us uh, and in my knowledge in our university in jnu etc i think absolutely nobody is uh, researching on this aspect uh, as on now but we have a center for chinese studies and young scholars you know they are taking up various uh, research projects similar to this so maybe very soon we will also have some researchers in india who will be researching on the flow of uh, you know uh, artifacts and uh, textiles silk textiles cotton textiles across the world including japan korea and china so i think uh, now we will move to our uh, next uh, speaker the discussant uh, dr urmila uh, mohan uh, i think it's it's 5:45 in indian time so we will have uh, um, uh, around uh, 15 to 20 minutes you can take i think i think uh, professor tanga will allow that so uh, around 20 minutes maximum please go on Dr. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Professor George. And uh, thank you, um, Kyung Hee. That was a fantastic, fantastic talk. Very, very detailed. Uh, amazing survey. And um, I'm so glad you packed in so much into that because I realized that these are events where we have students here and uh, this is a lot of very, very useful information that they can come back to uh, through the recording later and, and parse in their own uh, time and pace. um i'm i'm going to approach this talk from the perspective of um anthropology uh and i want to start by i teach a course on museum anthropology it's called the social lives of museums um and i want to return to something that is very influential when i talk to students and i think also in orienting us um that is what is history and i'm sure that's a very fraught topic but when we talk about it we we kind of uh, go back to you know the ideas of michel rolf trullo where he talks about in the chapter introduction to silencing the past he talks about how history is that sense of the past right uh, and every culture um has a sense of pastness right what is pastness um and uh, i think at this moment especially when there's so much of interrogation of uh what these disciplines mean what agendas and biases and gaps they may have been founded upon uh particularly so within anthropology when anthropologists are asking themselves what are we doing as a discipline you know um are we an art are we a science uh, we are we are in a very difficult position i think and that's part of the the uniqueness of what we can contribute to a discussion but i think it's very very interesting the way history and anthropology come together in professor kyung hee's talk and i think i would i would urge the students who are listening in the scholars who are listening in as to 
be aware, take that, that kind of lesson of reflexivity from anthropology and say, uh, how do I fit into this dialogue? Uh, uh, to kind of break that fourth wall, right? To break that fourth wall of saying that um, the frame is completely established by the discipline. Uh, the discipline itself is ultimately only people, right? And our conversations change depending on who the people are and of course who is in the center and who is on the margins. Um, so I would kind of take the analogy of Kyung Hee's uh, amazing uh, visuals and the astounding image of the deities in the beginning and say, what is the fragment? What is the fragment that we are studying and what is the frame that we are using to study it? Because that frame is what is giving us the context and uh, anthropology is ultimately uh, a contextualizing act. We take this, we take history, we take from linguistics, we take from cultural geography, and we did try to combine all of that into this uh, social scientific narrative, uh, constantly trying to bridge between our own positionality, our own uh, identities as citizens. And I think uh, Kyung Hee used this word in the beginning, she said, it's also dealing with this establishment and development over the last century um, of cosmopolitanism, right? These are, a lot of these are very urban, urban people who are, have the sense of curiosity about the world, but also a desire to somehow control the narrative. And I was so appreciative of the numerous ways in which um, Kyung Hee was troubling the narrative. She was constantly kind of bringing in these things that was, uh, you know, trying to create these entry points for creating good trouble. So I would actually urge the students to create good trouble and actually interrogate uh, and be critical. Uh, and the thing that um, I really want to point out is that gets lost in this discussion of reception studies where, you know, of course, most of us just do not have that privilege of going behind the scenes into a museum collection and seeing these textiles, um, is that the museum itself is a culture, right? Uh, as standard historical practice, all art historians know this, all historians know this, the archive itself is a cultural product. We have seen uh, who those expeditions, uh, who those travelers were who went to Central Asia, who had that sense of curiosity and who collected those objects. So the archive starts getting curated, uh, not after it gets into the museum, it starts getting curated at the point of collection, right? So I would urge the students to start paying attention to those stories, not just of objects or maybe of dignitaries of specific expeditions, which are very, very important, but to really study the politics of museums as um, uh, archives that decide the narrative of what you are going to study way in advance before you even get to that point of seeing the exhibit. And of course, this editing and this curatorship is something we all have a very, very heightened sensitivity to, as well as this issue of representation, which is not just, of course, as we know, not just the semiotics, but also the way these narratives get created between the real object, what we'd call the real object, uh, even if it is fragmentary, um, and uh, the many ways it takes on new lives, it takes on new social lives when it's presented in a, uh, you know, a contemporary uh, modernist minimalist museum versus being presented in a royal um, museum versus being presented in a Met catalog. So we always have to pay attention to the context. Um, the other thing is that she talks about, um, Kyung Hee was of course, you know, talking about artworks. And I find it fascinating because of course, depending on our disciplinary proclivities, we refer to these objects uh, in very different ways. So maybe as somebody who's an anthropologist and I'm very concerned with the functionality of that item, uh, I'm of course uh, mesmerized by the beauty of the banner, 
but I am more, my imagination is triggered more uh, by this notion of um, the, the functionality of that banner and that ritual context. So I think that what was implicit perhaps and could really be paid attention to in future projects of students who are going to work with these collections is that notion of ritual. I think that notion of ritual and religion really, um, of course, as we know, Buddhism um, and Hinduism, Jainism, all of those things kind of getting uh, kind of transmitted along, ideologies and practices getting transmitted along with these artifacts, because we can't forget the fundamental point. Um, there was eternal human issues of life and death. Uh, and these artifacts is so fascinating that so many of the objects you were showing us were funerary objects. Uh, so what were those such powerful belief systems um, that made people want to make those objects? I think there's a very kind of charming human connection there that we are still struggling with of life and death. Um, the last thing I wanna talk about is uh, heritage. And I think, again, come back to this notion of um, a lot of these discussions on decolonization, whether they are happening in the Korean context or whether they are happening in a museum in the US, uh, are definitely about uh, who, who, owns, who owns these artifacts. Uh, there's a lot of problematic politics around the fact that these artifacts are cultural treasures of one country or viewed as absolutely indispensable to the imagination, as Benedict Anderson called it, the imagining of these nations. So what does it mean when the Metropolitan Museum in New York has a collection of these artifacts uh, and calls itself a world civilizational museum, right? So it's these, these kind of, uh, what, do we, what are we dealing with in these cosmopolitan endeavors? What does it mean to have a global museum? And do we really want to have, you know, metropolitan museums of art all over the world? So there's a lot of debate going on within the museum community, especially in light of the last year in the light of Black Lives Matter, in the light of social justice movements, uh, in the light of what the pandemic has done to all of us, we have realized that a lot of us can no longer uh, have this implicit faith in the government, in the state, uh, to take care of us and our problems. So what role do museums as cultural institutions have when it comes to mediating these messages? And I just love Kyung Hee's point about today's generation. Um, People are not willing to just simply go to a museum and look at artifacts anymore. They want to be, they, they, especially as more and more of our students are graduating from our programs and are coming up with highly critical uh, theories and insights into museums, we have, become, we have this meta-consciousness about what museums do as cultural institutions. Um, so uh, what does it mean to be a cultural space? You know, what does it mean for those objects to be in an American museum connecting with the Korean or the Japanese diaspora, which is a very different kind of relationship versus exhibiting these objects in Korea, uh, where the, the narrative may be more of uh, um, nationalism or very different from exhibiting it in New Delhi where the narrative could be pan-Asianism. So I think it was wonderful to have this consciousness running through on so many levels that, um, you know, this larger political economic context that makes it possible even for our uh, international collaboration to happen today. And also, of course, not to ever forget technology and techniques, because it's not just we are expanding not just techniques of embroidery and weaving and conservation and restoration, of course, but we're also talking about, you know, Zoom and Meetup and everything else that makes it possible. So I just want to open the frame to make us conscious of those kind of decisions and also realize that a lot of these projects, which are about revivalism and revitalization and kind of restoring the narrative, uh, come from very specific kinds of positions and agendas and narratives. Uh, and that, that as cultural historians, as anthropologists, we have to pay attention to whose sense of the past is being called into question by these exhibits. If we want to go beyond having retrograde exhibitions displaying the same narratives, albeit with beautiful objects, uh, but having new narratives that challenge us where the museum space is not just a display and representation, but a space of making new knowledge. So I'm just going to stop on that. Thank you so much.
And I just like thank to you, thank, thank, yeah, thank Dr. Uh, Arminda uh, Mohan's uh, thoughtful comments. I really uh, like anthropological approach to, me, to the museums. The museums uh, that uh, we often go to is a product of imperialism in the 19th century, right? Like, so in South Korea, for example, we don't have a natural history museum. Do you know, like uh, the, the New York, we have a American Museum of Natural History and London, right? You also have... Uh, uh, the British like a uh, national natural history museum or, or something right any any like a uh, large countries who used to be empires they have the natural history museum but Korea we don't have it because we were the victim of uh, imperialism right we were a colony of it once and so we don't have those ambitious <laughs> imperial museums so I often wonder what will happen if uh, you know the um, Korean government decides to have a sort of a national museum of anthropology, then what will happen? This is Central Asian objects from Otani collection. Mm. Would they go to there? And I, you know, I guess it will be split. All of those daily objects or sort of a lifestyle objects will go to anthropology museum and then that, you know, Buddhist mural paintings or a sculpture made of clay and something will be made here. So this is our artificial division of a culture, right? What is more valuable than others? And, you know, I don't know so much about India, but uh, India is a huge country with a large civilization. But in um, in the context of museum in North America and Europe, a lot of objects were bought and sold. So a lot of these textile specimen is very expensive too. And those were sold and bought because we have a major collectors of textile fragments. Um, so this is the context of something that you would think about. Like, uh, as, as Professor Mila Mohan said, uh, what constitutes an art museum? <laughs> you, you, you should see, think something expensive <laughs> that you pay a lot of insurance fees that would go to the art museum. Um, so definitely there are more context to it. And uh, Professor George uh, is waiting to speak. Yeah, actually, uh, I would uh, first of all express our gratitude to Dr. Urmila Mohan for her uh, brief but very encouraging advices and uh, information given to the participants. And also Dr. Kyungi for uh, you know, uh, adding some more you know, opinions and uh, suggestions and ideas on that. Thank you very much. Now we have uh, actually we are already uh, you know, we completed 90 minutes. Now we'll have uh, maybe 15 to 20 minutes for a question and answer session. So uh, I think uh, those who want to ask a question, please raise your hand so that we can, uh, you know, you can ask the question directly to the uh, speaker, speakers. And first of all, from my side, I would like uh, uh, Dr. Professor Bristanga to comment if you have any comment. On today's uh, well, uh, uh, thank you, uh, he and uh, Urmila. I think uh, both of you did your presentation really well, and uh, you know, uh, took a difficult topic and really put it in context. And your comments, have, I think, uh, opened up areas for discussion. Just taking off from you, I mean, I have worked on uh, Utani Kozui, and so I'd have a lot to speak on him, and maybe even uh, Dalwood. Um, but uh, I thought uh, it's interesting. I mean, I was quite interested in what you said about uh, some of the objects, uh, silk objects, actually may not be silk at all. Uh, you know, this malleability, this, um, uh, you know, it is reflective of also our historical vision as it changes. But I think looking at the Otani collection, uh, he had a set of objectives which he brought these things together. Um, my understanding was that you know two things in two ways. He, he actually spent his own money, meaning the Honganji money, and the Honganji was really rich. Sorry, where is this coming from? Uh, there's a lot of noise. Any, it's okay now. Uh, can you hear me? Yes. Ah, sorry. Suddenly there was a lot of. Uh, um, noise. I don't know. Anyway, what I was saying was that the Otani collection it was put together with, I think, a couple of objectives in mind. One was Otani wanted to show 
that as a Buddhist, they had, if you will, not just the right, but the ability to trace the connections, you know, the transmission of Buddhism. They knew the text, they knew the sources, and so on and so forth. Um, uh, but he, but he also seems to have a vision of Asia because he travels around not just in China but in certainly Central Asia, India, Turkey. He actually travels quite extensively in Europe as well, Norway, and so on and so forth. So you know, uh, and from his collection that you show, it wasn't just Buddhist objects. He was picking up whatever objects he could get. Uh, he was also building villas and doing other things and trying to start industries and. Mm -hmm. So there's a uh, you know there's a whole sort of uh, world view out there, but when you take that collection and now the Koreans, uh, are having dealt with their colonial past, are now beginning to re-exhibit these things. Uh, you know the collection takes on a whole different uh, meaning, yeah. and so you know you need a different sort of museum, if you will, to display all this. And even the uh, perhaps the meanings of uh, the Silk Road have changed over the uh, decades and centuries. Uh, the explorations of uh, the Orientalist scholars, Sven Hedden and Orlstein, after all, worked for the British government. So a lot of the uh, stuff that he bought or came to India, but it was mostly packed and sent off to uh, England. Uh, some pieces are in the National Museum. and. In India, there's quite a lot of work on uh, Silk Road uh, in terms of design, art, history, and so uh, trade also. Um, so, so I was just wondering what you th uh, think about uh, how uh, Utani Kozvi is thought about in Korea today, and you know he's a complex figure. Uh, Yes, thank you so much for your thoughtful comments and question, uh, Professor Tanka. I knew that you have a lot to say about, uh, you know, Otani Kozui because the the chapter that you wrote for my book, uh, you know, we have that section on uh, Otani, you know, what he envisioned about Asia, you know, and the world citizen and other things. So, uh, yeah, it's. Um, you know, like uh, this is an interesting transformation of the way Korea perceives its national history. You know, I, I went to high school in the 80s. So it was also during the military dictatorships. So I know what it was like, like, uh, you know, people really hard to search for what Korea misses, right? Like uh, what Korea distinguished from another country. But now in 2010s and 2020s, uh, I usually go back to um, Academy of Korean Studies or Seoul National University in order to refresh my like a National History 101 because the scholarship changes, right? As Professor Armila agrees, the historiography changes. And now they want to see Korean history in the context of global history more and more. And it's almost like a comparative literature kind of thing. So a lot of people speak foreign languages, right? And then they want to you know, see Korean history in a larger context. And also one of the motivation to it is the um, the really uh, invincible and powerful China, People's Republic of China. Like they want to uh, include anything related to Chinese history as a part of their you know, history writing. So um, Korea actually at the moment have some uh, historical dispute uh, over the history of a Manchu area. Like so during the Three Kingdoms period from the um, fifth to seventh century, Manchu was part of Go Kuria, which was part of the you know kingdom, uh, three kingdoms. So you know a lot of those things. So in a way, um, the Silk Road, like a new exhibitions on the Silk Road are also perceived in that effort, like how do we counter argue um, the Chinese uh, narrative of you know one large Chinese civilization, right? If you see Silk Road, um, you know there is currently a political um, struggle in uh, Xinjiang Uyghur area, right? Um, so all of those together um, somehow. Uh, the Otani's expedition itself, of course, it's uh, it's resulted from uh, his vision um, as as a citizen of Imperial Japan. I mean that that's one thing. Uh, but then you know in the history writing as of now, uh, the museum curators uh, and then historians they also try to tackle uh, another dimension of uh, nationalistic 
history writing <laughs> from the People's Republic of China side. <laughs> so uh, it, it's very complicated. But by listening to Professor Tanka's uh, talk, I mean, you know, in 1910s and 20s, we definitely had this kind of cosmopolitan global citizens uh, like Otani. Otani is not just one exception. Again, there are a group of people like those. Uh, and it will be really interesting you know, actually to, to write a book together uh, on these topics, uh, you know, from multi dimensions, not just from the Japanese studies side, but, you know, look at these people like Otani, Kozi, you know, Kozi, and he's seen from, why, you know, how he's seen from Korean side. And then I'm also really interested in his collection uh, that's left in, um, uh, what is it, uh, Lu Xin, uh, not Lu Xin, uh, the... Yeah, Lu Xin is one. No, 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 Dalian is currently in Manchu. <laughs> Dalian, um, China, what, what did I say about uh, his collection that's left in uh, uh, the border of Wuxin? Uh, 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 yes, Wuxin. Uh, right, right, uh, in China. You know, so I, I, I didn't read the Chinese side of literature yet. I mostly focused on you know, <clears throat> Korean uh, historians and um, those Silk Road textile historians. Uh, but I want to see what it is like. We know a lot about what British people think about the Orestein and other collections, but a uh, very interesting and complicated person. Yeah, Lucian is a little hard to address because uh, there's a naval base there. So to get, to get into Lucian as a foreigner, you need some special permits and things. I tried going oh, there. I see. So, I see. I see. Mm -hmm. yeah. but, uh, it, it, yeah, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Uh, kyung -hee, and also thank you, Professor uh, Tanga, for the briefing and uh, question. Now, I think there is a question in the chat box from uh, Dr. Urmula Mohan. Uh, what, would it, what would it be like for somebody to reenact these expeditions today? This question is to Dr. kyung -hee, I think. Uh, could you please... Uh, uh, answer to this. So, uh, actually, you know, speaking. What would it be like for somebody to reenact these expeditions today? I think this. All... Yes, I understand. But Professor George, you have to mute. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. So, <laughs> so recently, I was uh, working with my colleague Pravin Chaudhary about his expedition to uh, weaving neighborhoods or weaving towns within Central Asia, and it is extremely to visit those countries because, as I mentioned earlier, almost all those northern and southern Silk Road routes are now part of China up to Kashgar, right? And then after Kashgar, it is uh, sort of a um, India too. India is involved with a border border protection <laughs> between India and and China, so it's very difficult. I mean, my own colleague is American citizen, even though he's from India, and um, getting into a visa to go to even Tibet or um, Kashgar it was very hard. So he would go to Ladakh, and then he would try to go, but he cannot go over the board. Um, so this is something that we don't really think about. As uh, uh, Ermila said, it's, it's usually I discuss this museum uh, audiences and you know museum practices in the urban setting, right, cosmopolitan setting. But what about these people really living in those border areas? Uh, and that's why I was involved with this Invisible Nomads project. Um, they actually don't own these people, citizens living in the border areas. They don't own passports sounds really strange, but because they live on top of the mountains and migrate in like six months here to six months there, they don't have that passport system. Um, so um, they are sort of uh, undocumented, even though they live there for hundreds and hundreds of years. Um, and then, you know, what is interesting these days is I actually meet students coming from the Xinjiang Uyghur area. Uh, they are not ethnic, ethnic Uyghurs, they are Chinese, uh, students uh, families but they say they grew up there you know family moved for work and, and other reasons and they actually very fond of that um can i say like a central asian like a uyghur culture uh and i talk a lot about it and um it's interesting to talk about like ethnically they are not uyghur they don't speak uyghur or turkish right but then they talk about it. And also, I also meet many activists who visit the Xinjiang Uyghur area um, as a, uh, what is it, like a uh, 
social advocates, and some of them are studying cotton croppers. So people, I mean, I, I work at the Fashion Institute of Technology and a lot of professors are involved with the International Cotton Organization or Supima, you know, those brands of the cotton manufacturers. Anyhow, they visit um, Central Asia, like Kashgar, you know, those areas. And um, it is all about human rights issues. Like, so the actual indigenous populations of bigger areas, they are working in the farm the cotton farm, and those labor conditions are not reported to the world. And the way I you know, listen to these visitors' story is really heartbreaking. So um, as Ormila mentioned, it's interesting to mention as a scholar myself. I mean, I usually work with dead artists, like you know, dead for 100, 100 years, right? And then I'm not really involved with the pol con contemporary politics, but you know, for the past 10 years while teaching that the art of the Silk Road, I realized that this is not about the Silk Road of the, uh, you know, the, the monk Xianzang of the 8th century. Like I have to move on to, to the actually 21st century. It is a moment of reawakening. Uh, and that's why I wanted, me, wanted to meet like, uh, you know, Professor Tanka's uh, audiences who study Japanese studies mainly in India, like uh, what, what it means, you know, like uh, our historical perception keep changing. Uh, anyhow, there is a, a question by Professor uh, Erdar Kuchu Kachin. Kachin? Yaochin. Erdar Kuchu Kachin. My surname is a little bit too uh, long, so you can just, you know, omit it. Uh, um, okay. Uh, well, uh, First of all, thank you so much for this fascinating uh, presentation. Uh, I, I was uh, overwhelmed to see uh, the uh, silk broideries uh, on uh, Charlemagne's tomb and how it is related with Byzantine uh, uh, Empire uh, in, in an area in the geography that I'm all, already li at the moment living in. I'm in Constantinople, I'm in Istanbul. I'm a uh, historian at Boaz University Asian Studies uh, Center. Uh, but I have, as Brish has already mentioned, I have worked on Otani Kozui's life and, you know, deeds and everything. Um, uh, so, um, one little note, maybe I can, uh, if I may, uh, you know, make a little contribution to your uh, narrative here, is um, that uh, when we talk about Otani Kozui and his expeditions, the Otani expeditions, um, uh, sometimes this Asianism or Pan-Asianism, uh, uh, as some uh, people like to call it, uh, comes uh, forward. But, um, I mean, it, those expeditions um, uh, offer us more information. It is deeper uh, than, you know, just uh, labeling as Pan-Asianist uh, mot uh, motivated, uh, you know, research, uh, uh, let's say, attempts. Um, I would uh, like to mention uh, that Otani Kozi was the patriarch of the largest uh, Buddhist community uh, in Japan. That is Shin Buddhism uh, with Eastern and Western branches. It is already, I mean, uh, the Shin Buddhism, the, uh, 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 sh the Shin Buddhism is still the largest denomination of Buddhism in Japan. So, with the start of a uh, major revolution, major restoration, let's say, uh, that movement, um, uh, it, it, there was a surprising uh, development in Japan, Japan where, uh, as you know, uh, the Shintoists started persecuting Buddhists. So, as the leader of the uh, largest uh, Buddhist denomination in Japan, not Kozui himself, but his father, actually, uh, had to do something uh, about it. He had to find a way to consolidate, to negotiate with the uh, new government in order to carve out a, a, a space of uh, uh, freedom uh, for his creed. So at that junction, he, he's, uh, of course, Otani was uh, in uh, London for a while then, he had all the means and all the uh, circumstances that could enlighten him 
uh, uh, with the uh, ideas of um, uh, you know of sending an expedition there. But the, basically, as far as I can understand, all the three expeditions were organized, planned, and executed uh, with the drive, main drive of uh, finding the roots of Buddhism or the roots, the roads through which Buddhism had passed through. That's, you know, Central Asia, China, uh, Korea, into Japan, uh, in order to um, prove both to their own selves, but also to the Japanese government that Buddhism is a, uh, is a global phenomenon like Christianity. But also, it has a, a deep roots uh, within the Japanese. Uh, I, I, sorry for interruption. Please be, you know, brief in your question because we are running, uh, you know, okay, okay. late. But, all right. So please then, be, then, come to the then, question, please. Okay, I, I'm not. I'm not going to ask a question. Uh, this is li a little comment. Uh, but final word: uh, the um, the combination of all his efforts is, is published as, a, as you know in three volumes as Shin Saikiki. It means the new uh, records of the Western region. It is an allegory uh, for the Xuanzang's uh, Great Tang records of the Western regions. Uh, so, okay, I'll oh, thank you. Yeah, thank you, thank you. Is there any 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 comment you want to make, uh, Doctor Kyungi? Oh, thank you so much. I mean, you know, it is very important that you you mentioned it. You know, like, uh, yeah, I will, I am aware of his religious mission side of it. Um, and um, you know, it, it's interesting that uh, to hear that um, you know Shintoism, uh, you know, tried to suppress uh, Buddhism. Uh, and uh, you know, if you see 1920s and 30s, a lot of Zen Buddhist monks of China, I mean Japan, they also uh, write their um, textbooks or uh, you know meditation books or the history of Zen Buddhism in English, right? Like a uh, T.D. you know T.D. Suzuki, right? Like a uh, you know those those uh, masters, right? They also you know try to be globalized, I, I guess. Uh, but the impact of those English. Uh, English language books written by those Zen masters had a heavy impact on contemporary artists in the end. Uh, but anyhow, uh, thank you so much for your um, uh, comment, uh, Professor Yalchin. And then there is a question in the chat box uh, by yeah. Ranga. Uh, so I'm going to read it. Questions about the disciplinary approach to the problem of cultural slash heritage ownership. How disciplines like a museology, anthropology, and a history are debating on the question of cultural ownership, especially in the light of recent debates on cultural heritage commons. I think this is for Professor Ormila. <laughs> yeah, actually, yeah, if you if you want me to add a little, uh, this is basically a follow up to Professor Ormila Mohan's idea. But when we are talking about Silk Road, we are necessarily talking about a large global history, right? A part of mm -hmm. global history. And when you are talking about global history, we are necessarily talking about commons, right? So it's basically something about creative commons or cultural commons, heritage commons, and all this. I mean, the whole one hour talk, uh, we are talking about these kind of things. I mean, we are talking about uh, multiple ethnicities, multiple cultures, multiple linguistic barriers. And so how are you, your discipline? I work uh, on literature, and I'm interested in history and all. And we, we do, I mean, since last since last half century, there are a lot of debates on, uh, on who owns what things. I mean, for a literary work, who owns those kind of things? There are a lot of debates. And in recent years, there is uh, a lot of debates. Uh, sorry, Gauranga, it is a comment or uh, you want to ask a question? A question. This is a question. question please this is exactly a question. question. Please yeah, yeah. this is a question. Yeah. 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 So uh, basically, in case of say, literature, for instance, we uh, we we... Uh, there is debate, uh, for instance, uh, the, the people are trying to break the divide between human and non-humans. So, mm -hmm. so there is no, there is no clear cut ownership. So, I was wondering how, for instance, anthropology or art history, I mean, how how you you, you handle approach that particular question. Yeah, so I think it's a very complicated question. I'll give you a very quick, try to give you a very quick answer, and then maybe we can take the discussion if you want to later offline. So I think you're asking a couple of different things. You're asking about theoretical and analytical positions. I think you're also asking about strategies and tactics. 
right? And I think anthropology is a great field in this because that is precisely what we are good at doing. We're good at looking at the real life aspect of things and seeing whether the theory we are generating can actually be applied to those situations. So let me give you an example. There was somebody on the chat right now who unfortunately is no longer there. And she's a wonderful young Indian scholar called Sonali Khuria, and she's in Delhi and she worked with the National Human Rights Commission in India, right? So she has worked on from, as a legal scholar, as a parallel legal and legal scholar also and got her doctorate from Jamia Millia. And um, she is looking at uh, the role of the Indian state's uh, nuclear imaginaries, right? The power, the power of nuclear energy and nuclear imaginaries and how communities come into conflict with that imaginary of the nation state, for example, um, uh, who, which is that community in Rajasthan and Haryana, they have different, different uh, communities, but the, the Bishnoi, Bishnoi group, right? The Bishnoi group. Now that is a classic example of what we're talking about: human-animal relations or human, uh, you know, environment, ecological issues, right? So I think you're right that ecological paradigm and uh, what you call more specifically human, non-human, which kind of comes interestingly from um, kind of uh, Latour and STS studies and all of those things, which I have my own issues with, frankly speaking. Uh, so it's very much a debate about uh, can we find a solution solidarity and a shared similarity in the notion of what I'm hearing in your question, activism, and is there a possibility for resistance, for resistance potential in these in these uh, coming together of uh, theory and practice? And I'll hand it over to Professor Kuhnhi. Well, I mean, it's, it's the domain of uh, Armila, uh, but when it comes to this issue of um, you know, heritage and ownership of cultures uh, in East Asian context is usually governed by the national identity. <laughs> and um, also when it comes to power and, and research, um, we are very much influenced by support, government support. So look at Japan Foundation. It's one of the most efficient organizations when it comes to cultural policy. And we heavily rely on it, right? To go to Japan or study Japanese subject matter. Korea was has the equivalent called the Korea Foundation and, um, uh, and the Academy of Korean Studies. And I don't use a lot of Chinese funding sources. I don't know what mainland China has so many, uh, but in the US, we also have uh, foundations to support uh, sinology or Chinese studies. The reason I'm mentioning this is I wanna go in between land, for example, Asian Americans uh, or Southeast Asian Americans. But when I move into those domains of the research areas, there are not many platforms, um, you know, where I can be stay active. Um, so in a way, like the national authority or, you know, the economic power plays a huge role. And, and then the encyclopedic museums, um, just like a Metropolitan Museum or British Museum and the Louvre, as you know, uh, these East Asian countries worked really hard to carve out their own space, right? You have a Japanese gallery and Korean gallery. And uh, and uh, we don't usually call it Indian gallery. There is a South Asian art because South Asia is a huge like a continent, subcontinent in itself. Um, so uh, it, it matters very much, you know, what, what um, you know, these cultural heritage uh, commons are defined by nations, you know, at the national state at the moment. Uh, but in my other activities, along with the contemporary artists, as you can imagine, a lot of people are transnational. Some of you are transnational as well. Um, and you, you don't know, I mean, I always say, you don't know where you are going to die. You may die in um, New Zealand. <laughs> so we are, you know, in a way transnational and how are we going to define ourselves? You know, am, am I going to die as a citizen of New Zealand, right? Like. Um, um, so in a way, um, it is a fluid. We have to, you know, accept that this is a fluid concept. But I think that cosmopolitanism um, is is, a, is also an issue. Uh, recently, among contemporary artists circle, we talk about really wealthy cosmopolitans versus poor nomads. Uh, and Professor Ermira can talk a lot about it. But if you're wealthy enough to go to three different countries, you are cosmopolitan. But if you live as a political refugee and don't have enough and you work for other artists' studios, then you are sort of a simply global worker. 
Um, and I consider myself an education worker. Sorry that I'm not the wealthy cosmopolitan. <laughs> but, you know, like uh, it, it all influences the way we perceive heritage and culture. Um, so, uh, I mean, that, that's what I can say. So Silk Road, you know, the more I encounter these people from Silk Road regions, I have a student from Samarkand or I met a student from Kyrgyzstan, you know, they all speak Russian these days, right? Like parents all speak Russian and German. Somehow they speak German as well. And then they all speak their own language, right? But even though you are coming from Samarkand, uh, some people are, uh, what is the name of it? Like a Timur? Like they are not really Sogdian either. Like somebody should tell you know tell me. It is so complicated. So the more I meet people from this region, you know, the more humbled I am. Like I only know the national boundaries of these countries, uh, and the way they define themselves. And and then once I even met a person who practices Zoroastrianism. Like I also okay. you know. Oh, sorry. No, Time is up. Be, be, be short, please. Okay. So, uh, yeah, it is very um, fluid. That's what I can say. Uh, there is no yeah. set parameters. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, now, lastly, I think I would request uh, Mr. Uh, Sato Koji, Director General of the Japan Foundation, to uh, you know, speak a few words or make a comment if he has anything on this program oh sorry just you know just i i was so much absorbed in the very exciting debate just you know so i i rather just wish that just you know this this long this this last just you know for a couple yeah. of a couple of more more minutes to go yeah. yeah so i don't i don't have any you don't have any comment yeah. So I think uh, Professor Thanga we can come to we can conclude the program yeah, I, well, I just wanted to say something, uh, which yeah, is, please. I think please. this question of art ownership, it's, you know, it's being debated across the world. Uh, and gradually, as uh, groups and people get more, if you will, uh, visibility and power, and the ability to speak. So, you know, they want to reclaim the Benin bronzes and so on and so forth. And I think uh, Central Asian uh, objects, there are two problems. One is, of course, it's all part of, in a way, colonialism. And uh, they've been scattered to uh, various uh, metropolitan centers. And gradually, as these uh, countries and people will get a little more voice, I think the uh, momentum is building up. The, you know, the Indian government and Indian private individuals have been working for quite some time to get uh, various things back. Uh, other, the Chinese have become very systematic about it. Uh, carrying out surveys and so forth. So th there is a climate where museums are beginning to think about what is happening, not just, there's a lot of stolen stuff also. Um, you know, for instance, Central Asian antiquities uh, in Tokyo, uh, a lot of them come out of uh, Afghanistan and Pakistan during the period of uh, unsettlement. You know, they were sold off by people, the locals, and they end up in various markets in Tokyo or New York or London. So. Um, you know, there's uh, there at various levels. I think uh, both consciousness as well as uh, uh, institutionalizing of ways of getting things back is happening. That's one area. Two, I think it's also the question of what you display and how you display. Some places people are beginning to object to their funerary objects being displayed in museums. They want them returned. Uh, these are not objects for. Uh, you know, tourist uh, pleasure, as it were. So that, you know, that I think um, that is the other uh, question. And fourthly, I think many museums uh, are changing their strategies also, both in terms of uh, outreach to the community, education, and also not just in displaying, but uh, in the way they display in a particular building, but maybe even taking the uh, exhibits out. Uh, of the museum itself to, you know, for instance, I've read about, say, in England, uh, museums lending objects to schools so that uh, children can actually see a painting and appreciate the color and the texture and so on and so forth. So I think, uh, I mean, all I'd like to say more is that today I think has been a wonderful presentation and uh, I'd really like to thank both of you, Urmila, for all the 
the way you responded to this talk and for many of the questions. But George, the floor is yours. You are muted, uh, Professor George. Can't hear you. You are Professor muted. Professor George, uh, you have to click sorry, microphone. Sorry, uh, sorry. sorry. Uh, from my side, I would like to thank both the speakers today and uh, the speaker and discussant. And also on behalf of uh, all of us, uh, uh, great, I would like to express our great gratitude to, uh, especially to Dr. Kyungi, Dr. Urmila, and then, uh, of course, the organizers also, because we are just uh, participants. Organizers require uh, great, uh, you know, you know, motivation and uh, encouragement from our side. So I would like to once again thank all of you uh, for uh, making this event so successful. Now uh, I would like uh, Tariq to take over the mic and then uh, uh, make, if you want to say a uh, word of thanks, would you, if you like to give word of thanks, please do that and then. Okay, uh, okay uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Kyungi, for the excellent discussion and presentation, Dr. Ulmela, for your very valuable comments, and all the uh, members of the audience who asked questions. Of course, uh, Professor Brijdanka is uh, curating, and uh, he's the main <laughs> brain behind the whole lecture series. Uh, no amount of gratitude will be enough for the Japan Foundation, who is always supporting us, not only in this, uh, but every other uh, activity that we take up in uh, Japanese studies in India. Thank you, uh, Sato-san. And uh, thank you, everyone, for joining in. We'll uh, soon uh, come out with a uh, notice about our uh, next lecture. And I hope that uh, most of you can join back uh, for uh, for the next lecture, which I hope will be as interesting as the first two. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thanks a lot.